Loving Lord, we thank you for this beautiful evening, bringing us together through this amazing way of letting us love you, experience your love through the voice of this child. This evening, may this be an evening in which we all enter into that childlike heart of loving you, following you, and loving one another in the church, remembering that we are synodal church. In this church, we listen to the Holy Spirit speaking through every member and enter into a realization that we belong to the mystical body of Christ, one body, one spirit, and everyone is filled with the grace of our Redeemer. Bless this evening. Enlighten our speakers. Bless all the participants and their family members today. And also we remember many people who are sick right now around us in the world. Heal them. Console them. Strengthen them. And enlighten every one of us to enter into this synodal living. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Annette. And thanks a lot to your uh, little daughter. Thanks for that wonderful singing, leading us into prayer. And now... Good evening, Father. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Gail David. Thank you. All the others could please mute your microphones. Yeah. Now, I would like to formally welcome every one of you. It has always been a joy to be part of your journey in all these online classes. Today is the culmination, and that is going to be on this Synodal Church, Communion, Participation, and Mission. And to animate this process, today we have some special guests. Uh, Miss Grace David. Christian faithful, so-called lay person who has done her MTH licentiate in Vidya Jyoti, and she is teaching in Columbus in School. Yeah, and she is a very dynamic, and I, as you see her, she's a very dynamic, very lively person involved in many activities. And she will be one of our animals. Welcome to you, Miss Grace David. We wish you and your family all the best. God's blessings. Thank you, Father. Secondly, we have Sister Prabina Rudum, belonging to Loreto Sisters. She is also part of our faculty teaching in Vidya Jyoti. And she, along with Miss Grace David and Dr. Father Stan Allah, three of them, are part of the synodal team in Delhi. Diocese, Archdiocese of Delhi. So therefore, Sister Prabina brings along with her a lot of her experiences in this field. And she is currently the superior of her convent in the school community there um, in Delhi. Welcome to you, Sister Prabina, and we wish you all the best. And uh, I think welcoming Father, Dr. Father Stan Allah, I would do it when it comes to the uh, Next part, before we enter into the speakers and moderator, Father will be the moderator of the day. I will take it up at that time. And Father is not unknown to you. He has always been part of us and his classes have been much appreciated. Welcome. So now we shall move to the second part. I invite Miss Grace David and Sister Prabina to give us that theological input, enlightenment into this synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. Over to both of you. Thank you, Father. Uh, Father, may I share my screen? We have a PPT. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Father. Okay. 
Uh, I suppose you all can see my screen. Yes, we see it. Okay, Father, thank you. Okay. So I begin now. Uh, I'm here to present a little background on what is synod and what does Pope Francis mean when he says for a synodal church. So on 17th of October last year, Pope Francis inaugurated the Synod, Synod 2021, Synod uh, up to 2023. The title is for a synodal church. And the most important part to note, dear friends, that this is a synod on synodality itself. So now the question arises, what is synod? Okay, we have heard this a lot. Let us look into it a little deeper to understand what is the historical meaning of this term, as well as what is the meaning of Pope Francis when he is inviting us to participate in this synod. Simple meaning, it's an assembly of church leaders. And I think the first thing that comes to our mind when we hear the synod word is that it's an assembly of, say, the Pope, cardinals, bishops. And of course, a few representatives of lay people and others who are concerned with the topic of the synod and perfectly so. That's the simplest meaning we can think of. Let's go a little deeper now. We look at the Greek roots of this word. It comes from the Greek word synodos. Okay. And if we break that word, it means together, sun, on the way, hodos. Now, hodos can also mean journey, way, manner, method, system. So what Pope Francis has done during his entire papacy is basically taken this Greek root of the word and he's used this meaning to talk about the church. And he says synod for him at this moment and for all the talks that he's been giving up to this moment, it is a path of journeying together. And for him, that is the way of being a church, a church where all of us journey together. Okay, it's uh, quite different from the meaning that we have in mind. And so I think this whole synod uh, is an invitation to go back to the roots and to understand that we are called to journey together. Even in the third century, we had St. John Chrysostom. He had said, church and synod are synonymous. So a church uh, is some uh, group of people, a group of baptized who walk together. In fact, if you'll all remember, the early Christians were called people on the way. Okay. And so we look at uh, the Bible again, the biblical roots. We see in Acts chapter 15, the first council of Jerusalem, where the whole uh, discussion around whether the Gentiles should be uh, circumcised and the elders got together. There was Peter, James, Paul, and all of them getting together to discuss an urgent, important matter which pertained to the life and mission of the church. And therefore, thereafter, we see there were many councils which came up together whenever there was a point to be discussed, wherever there was a conflict, a discussion, and councils have been, ha you know, being organized by the church, the, the authorities, including the community, to discuss important matters. Uh, but over time, we see uh, this whole structure changed. And we see, uh, we'll take a quick look from third century onwards, say up to Vatican I. We see this little structure, so to say, of the church change. And the councils were convoked with a very different group. The church's structure, in fact, had changed. It had become more like a pyramid where the Pope was at the top, then the bishops, cardinals, priests, and the lay people were at the bottom rung, and sometimes even out of all these conversations. So the whole idea of synodality, synod changed. It changed into a very different, very hierarchical structure. And uh, in fact, the whole theology of the time was that uh, the church and world are op opposites to each other. So we have to save ourselves from the world. And the world was seen as an enemy um, of sorts. So that was how it was up to First Vatican Council. But here in comes the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. And the popes here, we see both Pope uh, John XXIII and Pope uh, Paul VI, they ushered in a breath of uh, fresh air, so to say, opening the church to the world and the signs of the times. And there are three important things we need to know. Uh, the whole uh, understanding of the church was changed. It was all, church was not just an institution, it was a community, 
first and foremost church is a community of believers and it is a participative church second point there is the people of god concept this people of god is something we have to remember this whole idea of the church being a people of god where all baptized are the church it's not just the hierarchy the pope bishops cardinals who will decide everything who will participate in making you know uh, important decisions all baptized are called and the third important thing that happened was the establishment of the college of bishops and this was uh, felt that uh, you know uh, convoking councils and uh, they are happening in you know after so many years so the synod of bishops would be together to discuss important matters regarding local churches and to advise the pope and so several uh, such synods have taken place over the years you must be remembering the amazonian synod or the synod of the family or youth so there are different types of synods which have taken place and they continue to take place but now this particular synod that we are interested in is a very different synod and pope francis himself explains it in the uh, documents that are there that it's not an event it is a process and it's an invitation to all baptized and we see with this uh, synod uh, which is going to last for two years mind you from uh, started in october uh, 2021 and it will finish in october 2023 two years so, um, it's a process where the whole concept of discussion of consultation of what is going to come out for the has been decentralized it's become more integral involving all who are baptized that's all of us here okay and it goes to more i will show you going a little further little church these are two words you hear a lot in uh, your whole engagement with the synod over these two years and so we look a little more into this as father mentioned there are three themes for a synodal church which uh, pope has proposed communion participation and mission there are documents which are really explain this very beautifully and i really encourage you to look at the preparatory document and the vadamikum of the synod which is available online on the synod websites i'll be just giving you a very brief intro so the first part communion communion participation and mission okay so these are the three uh, themes communion by communion it means that diverse people we are all together in one fellowship in one faith and this reflects the life of the trinity the unity as expressed in the trinity participation it means all the, uh, the the priests the bishops the lay people all are involved in this we are listening we are dialoguing with an open mind for all stages and ages this is very important for us to realize we are all called to participate then mission the church exists to evangelize and therefore the to the entire universe and we as a single family with our identity of the church we have to follow this up as we create this you know synodal church see this synodal church uh, uh, will not happen uh, just like you know imagining it we have to take steps and so these themes as we reflect on it they will come alive and they will be seen in the life of a synodal church and this word synodality actually is a very important word it refers to the involvement and participation of the whole people of god in the life and mission of the church now this synodality is the style of how we live how we reach out how we gather how we talk to each other it's not about preaching it's about living the ordinary way of living so pope is saying synodality is the ordinary way of living of the whole people of god it is a mission of the church it's how we eat how we drink how we interact how we go to our work and how we work in our workplaces do we reflect a church do we reflect this communion this oneness this whole zeal for mission secondly the synodal church is going to be a listening church and i love this photograph of pope francis and it's very very um, clear he says we have to be a listening church we have to listen to each other and uh, this whole two year synodal path which has been outlined is uh, geared to make as much as possible that we listen to people okay so as i said um, the 17th october was the opening of the synod now the diocesan phase is on and i'm sure in many of your dioceses uh, the consultation will be going on in various groups it will continue till april then there will be the continental phase where all the the continental and they will be making a 
photosynthesis and some mating to the cinder bishops which will take place in October 2023. It's a huge task. Started. And once the Synod of Bishops takes place, there will be an apostolic exhortation from the Pope, which will lead us all in the. You know, as long as we. You know, are able to understand what the new. Where is sometime your voice is breaking? Oh. So, as I said, the participants of the Synod, this time, go ahead. Internet Father. Uh, so go ahead, network. go ahead. Now it's better. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll try. I'll... I, it's, am I clear now? Can't hear. Go ahead. I'll continue. Yes. So, I'm participants of the Synod are. From students to lay leaders to families to seminary. Okay. Domestic workers, institutions media persons, public relations, and most important people at the peripheries, people who are non slums, uh, slum dwellers, the uh, people who are uh, LGBTQIA community, addicts, mentally ill. So we have to understand, listen to their journey with God and the church. This is what uh, Pope is uh, visualizing that in this whole synodal process, we live, uh, we are able to interact with them, listen to them, and bring out their voices in our apostolic exhortation uh, before i end i'll just want to uh, show you this logo you have all seen it it's a beautiful logo designed by this artist isabella of france uh, this sun shines like the sun is the holy eucharist tree of life cross uh, horizontal lines of hands and holy spirit it represents the cross and the holy spirit then people of god very important you see 15 silhouettes and it represents the entire humanity. And it's interesting to note that the child is in the front. And uh, even our program began with a child singing. So a child is there in the front, differently abled, um, uh, young people, old people. Uh, and the bishop and uh, bishop is in between, not leading. You know, So it's like a synodal church. This is the whole idea of a synodal church. And uh, this is a beautiful uh, line in the document which gives us the purpose of the synod. And the Pope is clear, it is not just to, this whole consultation process for two years, it's not to produce more documents, but to plant dreams, draw forth prophecies and visions, allow hope to flourish, inspire trust, bind up wounds, weave together relationships, awaken a dawn of hope, learn from each other, and create a bright resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm hearts, give strength to our hands. So, dear friends, uh, we are in the midst of the synod. Uh, just keep this synod uh, purpose in mind. Uh, we are asking to and to have uh, this whole hope flourishing for a new way of being a synodal church. With this, I hand over to uh, Probina. Probina, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Miss Grace David. Thank you, Father. Both PowerPoint as well as the input. Now over to Sister Probina, please. Uh, thank you very much, Grace. Sorry to disturb you, Sister Prabina. Keep in mind the time frame, please. I have four minutes, yes. yes. Uh, so, uh, Grace has uh, left us actually with a lot of themes, you know, a lot of theological themes and nuances, which needs a lot of uh, time and attention. And uh, that's why I think the, the, that students, uh, all of us, I'm including myself also, all of us, the, uh, the word itself is so lovely, depth. So, okay, we who are depth students or depth collaborators, I think we could pick up any theme and you know go deeper into. So my uh, my attempt in this four minutes will to do that. You know, just pick up one theme, and uh, it's it cannot be exhaustive because of the you know it it needs a lot of attention. But just to show uh, how could we really relish these themes uh, theologically as well as as a life uh, uh, life changer. You know, like. Grace talking about style or, or the attitude, the whole transformation of our style or the attitude. So if you see on the screen, this is the only slide I have actually, okay? So because I'll just pick up one theme. That it says synod is an ancient and venerable word in the tradition of the church whose meaning draws on the deepest themes of revelation. So even from this uh, particular uh, phrase, which is from preparatory document, I'm just picking up one word that is revelation. So when we talk about the, this 
theme, you know, the, the deepest theme of revelation, uh, the deepest or the core theme of revelation is for us Christian is Christ, you know, is Jesus Christ. Uh, in and through Jesus Christ, God reveals God's self. So how, how this revelation, uh, uh, grace took us back to Jerusalem Council, if you remember, you know, taking the route, how the synodal journey, we don't begin today or yesterday or not even in Vatican II, we began actually in Jerusalem Council itself. That's what grace was leading us to. So I'm going to take all of us a little beyond that also, you know, the synodal journey, which actually begins uh, much before that. So let's look at uh, the, the revelation, when we talk about revelation in and through Jesus Christ, you know, one question uh, that from that theme also, I'm taking on only one aspect, that is, uh, what did Jesus Christ reveal? Or rather, the sharp question will be, uh, like, we all know Jesus Christ came to reveal God, you know, God to us. So what kind of God Jesus revealed to us? So without going in detail, you know, without going in detail of this, but we know as Christian, all of us, you know, that God, Jesus revealed to us the Trinitarian God. He He gave us the face, you know, even, even look at other tradition, other religious tradition, uh, we, we don't have this face of God. Even in Hinduism, we may have the Trimurti or Trinity, but the relationship between Trimurti and relationship of our Trinitarian or let's say Jesus revealed God Trinity is totally different. So if you look at the theme, which Grace has already explained, our Trinitarian God is God who journeys together. I'm looking at among themselves, you know, more uh, among themselves, they journey together in mutual love. And uh, while journeying together, you know, there's a perfect communion, uh, which, is, which is more resembling our call today, what, Pope Francis is calling us for that kind of communion. We may not have a perfect communion as Trinitarian God, but somewhat like we are looking for that, the perfect communion and also the participate, participating each, with each other, you know, that inclusiveness, I am in the Father, you know, Father is in me, so participating with inclusiveness and also this Trinitarian God is, our God is like somewhat who looks not inward, but outward, you know, going out to mission, going out towards that whole salvific mission. So uh, be it communion, participation and mission, this whole three aspect with grace beautifully explained, we again see in Trinity, you know, among themselves and beyond. So uh, when uh, for, for, for us to, I, I feel for us to go deeper into that and see Okay, then where are where am I in this Trinitarian journey? So that that will also take us to again the question, who am I? You know, taking again another question of that anthropology kind of anthropological question that who am I? You know, uh, then then for us Christian again again looking into the anthropology uh, Christian anthropology takes us to Genesis. In Genesis, we know that we, we are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, which image, which likeness? Again, we are creating the Trinitarian image. So if I, again, I am a Trinitarian, if I'm an image of God, the Trinitarian God, or, or I want to replace the Trinity now into synodal God, a God who is in communion, in participation, and out in mission. So each one of us, the Christians, we claim to be image of God of that kind, an image of God who is in communion, who is in inclusive, because participation is more about inclusiveness, how much I'm inclusive, and out in mission. I am in communion, in participation, in, I include all for what? For mission. So it's not inward looking, but outward looking. So I, I'm, I'm somewhat looking at the path there, like, you know, Trinitarian God inviting us to that kind of invitation to be synodal, uh, personally synodal. So I'm not going to go in detail there, but it's just uh, initiating the reflections, you know, where I know as students of theology, I still call myself a student, can actually pick up just one theme and, you know, that you can relish uh, the whole process. So friends, I know it is somewhat like a seed, you know, in the, in the, 
in some kind of movie or serial where you end in abrupt ending. So I'm going to do an abrupt end here, uh, welcoming you to actually relish. I'm just do, done in the four and Trinitarian, Trinitarian perspective that you can go on with, you know, Christological optics. You can look at from the Christian anthropology. You can go in ecclesiology. So there is a huge uh, space to go deeper. So. Uh, I'm somewhat in putting like, you know, serial just ending down like that. So here I end. So uh, over to you, Father. Thank you, dear Sister Prabina. That was a good way of combining with what Grace presented. And you have taken us into the theological understanding, how combining on the Trinitarian togetherness. And I like the concept of synodal God. Good. I think we need to imitate this synodal God and become synodal church. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sister Prabina. Now, uh, I also see lots of people have joined in between. A most welcome to everyone. We are, in fact, humbled, and it's a joy to see many more joining. And the presentation has gone on well so far. And the next part is going to be on the uh, four of our speakers from our own uh, depth group who have they taken time, prepared themselves well, and it will be moderated by uh, Dr. Father Tan Allah, uh, belongs to Andhra province, Jesuit priest. Uh, he's a professor in the faculty here in the uh, model theologian, and he has already taken a couple of classes for our people, so we all know him well. And it's it's a joy to have you, Father Tan Allah, and then we welcome you to moderate the program from now on. Uh, to simplify the process, I will just introduce our four speakers. Yeah. And then you please take over. First, we will have uh, uh, Miss Mar Mrs. Maria Kavita from Bangalore. She is a very uh, lively, active, involved person. Very often, she would uh, try to spread the word, in involve in the parish activities, reaching out. So we are really happy. And she helps out, as you know, now and then in admitting people, etc., in our classes. And she will be our first presenter from Bangalore, Maria Kavita. Hello. Yes. Good. Second, we have Mrs. Sylvia D'Souza from Goa. She is um, she is into the education department, I think, DEO or someone. So she is very busy. But at the same time, she has shown keen interest in technology. You see her background. Books full of books. My <laughs> engaging herself well and we are happy that she would be sharing with us only for six minutes all of them but remember that I, what, each of them were already given question each of them is given a question they will be responding to that welcome to you miss sylvia disuza from goa thank you father and then third we have uh, miss uh, shaman morris mumbai from bombay from mumbai uh, she is also very actively involved in uh, parish activities, helping youth animation, etc. Very dynamic, powerful person. And she has quite often sung and helped us in our prayer songs. And we are happy to have you, Shaman. I want to listen to you from your own personal experiences. Thank you, Welcome. Father. Thank you. Wonderful. And then we have given first to go all women. Now we come to Mr. Julian Arlapu from Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur Diocese. Um, I just requested people to volunteer, and he was kind enough to accept our my request. And I'm sure he will bring a different, wonderful perspective from his group, parish, from his life, etc. Uh, Mr. Julian, we are happy to have you. Welcome. And Thank you, Father. Thank you. Welcome to you. Okay, now let's begin with Miss. Maria Kavita from Bangalore, then Mrs. Sylvia D'Souza, Mrs. Ms. Shaman, and then Mr. Julian. That's the procedure. Father Stan Allah, please take over. Over to you. Thank you, Father Rajkumar, for introducing them and then introducing us. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Prabina and then Grace David for introducing. It's like uh, when the husband is going for marketing and he's asking finally, so what vegetable shall I buy? I'm going to the market. And suddenly wife says, why don't you buy A, B, C vegetables? But she's shocked for the first time my husband is asking me what to buy. Not that he was buy he was not buying good things, but the first time he's consulting. So that's the whole thing is uh, 
So everything is going well. Priests were doing their job well, sisters were doing well, lay people were doing well, everyone was well. But we did not have educated laity as now in the last 2000 years. We have highly educated laity idea of dignity is there and the Vatican II wanted a very participatory church. I'll, I'll take less than a minute. And the world has changed so much. Church was Central Asian church to Roman church to European church to the global church. The largest Catholic countries are outside Europe today. Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, India, Philippines. No one in right near Rome and Italy, France. So the world has changed so much. So Pope is asking for a both software change and the hardware change. So at the software level, we need to realize I am church and I love to be here and I want this to become much better, a wonderful thing. It's not bad to good from good to better. Otherwise, as if something is wrong, Pope is telling no. Pope is telling us to improve so that it becomes a net, much better church. Like if someone thought the child interfering in the entrance hymn, that's exactly the model is now. If someone said, why didn't they plan properly? Why there was formality? Why there was a seriousness? No, that the new church should be where a child will be there and there is excitement, there is a joy. If somebody thinks, why the church at all was there and disturbing the hymn, then you are on the wrong place. So that's where it exactly, we have to think of a new church where children could be playing around the altar perhaps. So that's the whole idea. So we are consulting ourselves and it's not solving problem, discussing issues, only another seminar, another presentation, another discussion, simply a heartfelt sharing. Pope is telling all the people in the world have an heartfelt sharing heartfelt listening and bold mm -hmm. speaking so all the three important things speak boldly don't worry whatever others think you simply whether you are in the church whether you are outside the church if anyone is telling you say you simply say boldly first second one is listen respectfully listen to learn learn to listen so it should be like a nice story where we are talking to each other uh, post dinner meal recreation and all that rather than to find out what's wrong with you, what's with me. So that's, it has to be a very informal sharing. So now I'm hoping that four of you are going to tell you some wonderful things, your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations, rather than an analysis of the church or problems of the church. No, your dream. So now let's go into straight into the sharing. Maria Kavita, please go ahead and take your time and then tell us your dreams about the church. Are you going into the order of that first one, the fundamental question or any of those things? It's fine. Go ahead. Yes, Father. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Father. I hope I have kept my uh, presentation uh, informal enough. Father Raj told me to keep it uh, very personal, so I've tried to do that. I hope I will do. I'm uh, sharing a screen right now, a presentation. After five minutes, I'll just say hand like this, but you take one or two minutes. To yeah, but I'm it. unable to share the screen, so. Okay, I got it. Ah. All right, are you able to see my screen, the presentation? Yes, we are able to see. Awesome. Just a moment, please. Yeah, sorry about that. So yeah, so the Synodal Church Communion Participation Mission. Uh, so Father gave me four questions to work on. The church, uh, the laity and the synod based. Uh, first, who is the church according to you? Why do you feel that way? So he wanted me to keep this very personal. Uh, I have kind of combined these two together in my slides. Uh, I will talk to you about my own personal experience of the church, what the church meant to me over the years and now. Okay. Are lay ministries and participation of the lay faithful encouraged? This is a yes and no question. I've kind of tried to keep it simple. Uh, will this synodal journey help you all? Uh, this also is kind of a yes and no question. I have tried to keep this simple as well. So my sharing is pretty much with this. Uh, who is the church and why do you feel that way? 
So this question actually uh, took me back to the basics. I actually went to dictionary and Wikipedia and you know tried to see what everybody else thinks of what the church is. And thankfully, I found that uh, everyone's reference of the church is not to the building, uh, but to a group of people. And most of the sites told me that it's a group of believers in Jesus. And I felt kind of good about that. That was a good uh, tone that set uh, me into, uh, set me rolling into, uh, you know, my whole uh, sharing. And I think on the whole, I'm just preempting where I'm going right now. For me personally, uh, the church is any place where God lives or abides. Now, I will start with my journey as a child and a little girl, what the church meant to me. My mother taught me that the church uh, is that beautiful building where there's a tabernacle housing the sacramental presence of Jesus. You know, So any building with the sacramental presence of Jesus or the tabernacle was a church. And that's where mass happened and we went and you know, the Good Friday services and all those um, services happened. You know? uh, it, as I grew up, the church also became a meeting place for uh, friends, families, and all my favorite people, you know. And of course, occasionally there was a ceremonious walk to the office of the parish priest, if you know what I mean. Uh, unlike today, today, uh, you know, most of the parishes have the parish priest coming out to greet and meet people. But in those days, we, they, the parish priest would be sitting in the office and we would walk ceremoniously to the office, either to off mass or, you know, share birthday chocolates and so on, you know. Um, so, uh, but we also used to go for daily mass, but that is not so much of fun, uh, more, you know, kind of starting the day with God. Okay. Now, why did I feel that way? Pretty much because, um, you know, as a child in, in outside of school, uh, those of you from my generation, right, you know, that outside of school, we had very lim limited opportunities with friends, uh, meeting people and so on. You know, there was no, like no social media, no Facebook. You know, so basically church was our social media then, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I'm right in saying that, but for me today, if I see social media in those days, that was my social media. Yeah. As I transitioned to higher classes in college and so on, um, I started recognizing slowly that it is this tabernacle, this uh, presence of Jesus in that church that caused people to congregate, come together right, uh, to uh, whether just to attend mass or the Good Friday services, or even um, in those days, uh, they had started conducting retreats um, and parish missions in uh, church, right, in the church building itself. So that tabernacle became the cause for people to congregate. And uh, even then, the church was just a place where I would go with family um, and uh, pray, uh, connect with God for that period of time. So other social structures existed, so it was no more just fun. We had very few activities in those days, unlike today. Uh, getting involved in those needed acceptance from family and so on. So why did I feel what I felt? My needs changed from a little girl to higher classes and college. My needs changed. The church catered to just one of those needs or a few of those needs. Yeah. Now today, who is a church? For me today, I know that every person who consciously seeks and thus believes in and receives God in and through Jesus is a small bit of a church, right? So all these people together make the full church, right? And every gathering of people who believe God in and through their personal encounter with Christ makes up the church. And, uh, you know, last but not the least, every Catholic practicing or otherwise, who by their baptism have received that commission of Jesus that we all know, right? Um, Two minutes. Is, is Go church. ahead. Okay. Why do I feel that way? Because as I told you in my first slide, right, is a place where God lives. Because Jesus said so. Yeah. I am the way and no one, and go, so on he goes to say, no one comes to me, to the Father, except through me. So Jesus is the way. And we go to the Father, Father God. And he also says, abide in me as I abide in you. He says, he abides in me. So I know that God abides in me, God abides in all these Catholics, God abides in every person who seeks him and comes together or, you know, prays and so on. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. I also, another reason is that I have non-Christian friends today, 
Muslims, uh, Hindus, all of them, right, who believe in Jesus, even though they are not able to accept them sac sacramentally, accept him sacramentally, or sometimes maybe even some of the teachings of the Catholic Church are not still not uh, palatable to them, right? So, are lay ministers and participation of the lay faithful encouraged? It varies from place to place. I would say most of the time, most of the places, participation is encouraged, but lay ministries, we are not yet there uh, to you know, form, empower, and support lay ministers or lay ministries as such. Uh, there's more fulfillment of tasks or creating event records and less collaboration is, is what I'm seeing in the parishes that I have been in. Will this synodal journey help you all? Absolutely. There's no better time to have a journey like this for India when there is a mission that is working to thwart or challenge our mission from the Great Commission. For the rest of the world, suffering with so many um, you know, things that are coming out in the open and it's becoming a challenge to, for people to live together. Uh, for Gen Z and millennials who've actually come to a point where religion seems to be the real cause for most of our problems today, you know, and they don't want religion. Gen Z and millennials would say that, you know, some dioceses, have, some dioceses have still not started the synodal journey. So I feel that, yeah, it will help, but there has to be some drivers that necessitate, necessitate, necessitates participation in this journey. Now, to conclude, I feel that there is a great need for all of us here to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit at all levels at which similar exercises are being carried out or supposed to be carried out uh, towards preparation of the Synod in 2023. We pray that the Spirit maneuvers every discussion in the direction he wants the Church to take going forward, that the Spirit rests upon the collated documents that will be prepared from these interactions worldwide, uh, that the Spirit gives wisdom to the papal team that will work on it, and then um, complete Lordship of Jesus over the Synod itself in 2020. Uh, that's it. Thank you for the opportunity, Father Raj, and for all of you for listening. Uh, over to Mrs. Sylvia de Sosa. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marie Kavita. And then, yes, uh, Sylvia, please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Sorry for that. Uh, I have no slides and all to present, as I've already told Father Raj about it. I will be speaking from my own personal experience, uh, not from the education department, definitely not, but uh, as my experience of being moderator twice of the parish pastoral council, and one term as secretary and another fourth term as an ordinary member. I would like to, you know, present before you my experiences. This was way back in the year 2003 when uh, the parish pastoral council was formed and this was in keeping with the synod that time, the teachings of the synod. And I remember uh, all the time, you know, when those 10 sessions were given to us to build up the leadership in the PPC members, amongst the PPC members, what was emphasized was a new way of being church. And I tell you that uh, from the point of synodality, which is the theme of this entire synod, this journeying together and listening together, when I uh, ponder and look back on that past experience of mine, I feel very happy to share with you that this, in fact, really happened with us way back in 2003. And uh, the amount of, you know, participation at all levels, the parish pastoral council uh, that was headed by the exco was animated by the dynamic leadership of the parish priest then, who fortunately was there with us for the entire two terms. And because of the, you know, because of the animation that we received from there, the routing in prayer, the time that was given for spiritual formation, most of the time I remember every three uh, months, there would be uh, somebody or the other who would be, you know, coming and sharing reflections with us in order to see that, you know, the ideal of the early church, which was so much, you know, laid before us as an example as to how community life in the parish should be fostered, that was all the time, you know, nurtured with this direction that was given to us constantly. And I tell you, 
that our parish pastoral council we had a representation of all the organizations the organs that were present in the church at that point of time be it the youth be it the catechist be it the legion of mary uh, we, there were also other cells like you know we had the family cell we had the social apostolate cell we had the liturgy cell so each of these people were all connected and there was a sort of an interconnectedness there was a sort of a beautiful networking where everybody felt you know they had a voice to contribute to and because of this the most beautiful thing that came out from all this okay this interfaith sharing also was the bridges we were able to build with people of other faiths in our parish we have over uh, 5000 families that make up our parish and in amongst this families we have around 100 and more households that belong to the hindu community and a little over 15 to 20 not more than that uh, muslim families so you know one of the things that was done was whenever we had this activities and all that were, were charted out with the annual planner and all the social apostolate cell always made it a point to see that you know we had some sort of sharing with them whenever it was ganesh or it was diwali you know there were some people who would go and visit them so sort of bridges were built and so much so that you know during the christmas week which used to be the high point of all the community coming together especially with the family day each of these people wanted themselves to participate and present even you know some of the items and all so literally it was like you know the universal mission of jesus he wanted the entire human family to live that life of communion and faith in the holy trinity it was actually at work so that was one thing another thing that you know at that point of time the marginalized especially the domestic workers we have a big number of people who normally come from jharkhand who work in the households in our parish and of course this is something very common across goa so these were people who were most of the time neglected and though some of them were actually you know practicing christians they did not find themselves at home in our liturgical setups and all because our language was sort of alien to them so you know we thought of as a parish pastoral council we thought it was high time they should be also drawn to the core if possible because these were the people on the fringes on the periphery so we used to uh, as part of the christmas celebrations we used to also have one day as a migrant day celebration we used to not use the word migrant okay but we would make it a point to say that all of them were drawn in and there would be you know faith sharing there would be you know uh, a deep encounter where like you know they would come and share their experiences and of course it would culminate with a Uh, uh, cultural program wherein you know they would showcase their cultural highlights and all so this was a way we really feel like you know the reading of today as father pointed out in the beginning uh, from the saint paul's letter to the corinthians how jesus's body is the mystical body and we are all important parts of it so you feel like as if you know with this type of faith at this type of community the the body was you know body of jesus was literally throbbing and this continued uh, this was a very beautiful uh, experience of all of us and i will like yeah just yes, one or two minutes about yes, yeah go ahead yes, i will I mean, wind up yeah. father yeah, but i will also wind up with one little negative experience because not every time we can have positive things only it, it's not that we did not have dissensions and all within a you know community and all but uh, at the same time because of the orientation that used to be given to us we were able to tide over all that but i also have an experience this was my experience being at the core but i also have an experience being on the fringe and what do i mean by that when we were no longer members of the parish pastoral council and we had a new hierarchy ecclesiastical authorities coming and taking over all this sort of you know this liveliness of the parish being so much throbbing with life you know it sort of began to recede and unfortunately uh, at the height of the pandemic when we were trying to you know reach out to this migrant population in our village all of us many of us pulled in our resources and all and we wanted to distribute these rations to them 
it was very sad that when we required a space to bring them you know we needed a very huge space where could whereby we could you know uh, practice social distancing and all and see that everybody was reached out unfortunately when we tried to get this space which was you know a church compound <laughs> we did not get the support and uh, i'm sad to say this that finally it was the temple which is around you know 200 meters away from the church okay they had that space and they came to our aid and helped us to distribute the rations to the migrants so what i mean to say is when we talk about synodality it's important that we you know cultivate that synodal mentality whereby all these mental barriers that we have wherein we talk about i you we they all these things should melt only then there can be true communion and when there is communion there is automatically going to be participation and we will be sharing in the mission of jesus i would like to just end i know we are put on limited talk time i would just like to end with what pope francis has very beautifully said let us not be content with a lukewarm and habitual faith like out of a manual let us cooperate with the holy spirit and with each other so that the fire that jesus came to bring into the world may continue to burn and inflame the hearts of all of us i think that will be true synodality thank you very much for hearing me out i hope i haven't encroached on somebody else's time thank you oh, that's fine thank you thank you very much uh, sylvia shamin go ahead there are lots of points you both of you brought in and then i'll uh, highlight them later but shamin go ahead first yeah, so my talk is a lot about uh, suggestions and uh, being experienced in this ministry for a long time. So, Father Raj, will you be sharing the slides for me? So I will just give you a gist. My question was, how does liturgy help us journey together as a church? How do we promote active participation of faithful? What are your dreams of life affecting liturgy? Any other suggestions? Yeah. So my, yeah, so my talk is broadly on suggestions, I guess. Yeah, you can start sharing. He's going to present. Yeah. It. So um, uh, liturgy is work of the people or people's work as per its Greek origins, liturgia. So celebration of liturgy is people's experience, a gathered experience, a community experience, a gathering to give praise and thanks, Baraka, a gathering in memory, Zikaron, of the death and resurrection mystery of our greatest liturgist, Jesus, a gathering unites us in covenantal love, Berith, a gathering united through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Epiclesis, transforming us into a wholly chosen people of God. Having said this, Pope Francis's journey together is surely a call in the right direction at the right hour. It calls the people of God to an introspection of the existing praxis that must give way to an effect, effective and enriching connect with the divine through liturgy. As we have seen in the past, synods have surely helped in giving direction, order, and meaning to our life in the church. The Holy Spirit is on duty 24 by 7 and an epiclesis is needed if we have to go forward to creating the synodal church it needs vigor strength enthusiasm pope leo the great defined liturgy as celebration there is a marked change since then in understanding this term today liturgy seems detached abstract almost clinical and the pandemic has given it a virtual dimension we somehow need to get the people of God back into the church. Easier said than done. Because I'm seeing once the churches have opened, there are very few young people in the churches. I think the synodality is one way of drawing attention back to the goodness of the church. We are called to be more accommodating, understanding, flexible. A very important aspect is that of listening. The people need to be heard to know that the church cares. The, church cares. the women of my parish, as an example, requested for an afternoon mass. It is still being considered. A movement from the church structure 
to invade the heart of the faithful is a priority. To make the people of God feel safe, comforted, cared for, to show that they are belong is the need of the hour. My parish during the pandemic worked at providing mobiles and internet packages so that the poor could hear online masses. A special need is required and effort from the clergy and laity. The liturgy is not priest urgia or nun urgia. It is laity urgia. People are important. I love the focus of the synodality calling us to journey together in creating a just and creative church rather than it being hierarchical. A need to transform the church from being obligatory and ritualistic to becoming self to giving to becoming life giving a small beginning could be made in small communities. I have experienced people sharing wholeheartedly when mass is celebrated in small communities. A thirst could be created for the liturgy, which can be achieved through training, seminars, quiz, musicals. People don't like to attend such thing. But an idea could be that we could attach it to a social or a cultural event. I normally organize a meal for the youth and throw in a catechesis at this point in time, a catechesis on liturgy, evangelization. So that gets the youth interested. When lady is touched by the Eucharist, there is bound to be transformation. For me, it begins with an interior attitude, a longing for a relationship with the divine, a need to recall his Jesus' sacrifice for me, to thank him, to praise him. The youth are well-versed with social platforms, the internet. They have questions, why mass? Why communion? Why community? They live in a culture of defining vision and mission. There is an urgent need to define this, to explain liturgical concept, uh, concepts, tradition, church history through church platforms, rather than they get misinformed through error-filled internet platforms, harmful role models, and wrong notions from strong political bodies. If such courses be made compulsory, then why not? When we know the reason we for the celebration, it leads to giving ourselves totally. The catechesis of liturgy to begin right from the instance of the first Holy Communion, so that the death resurrection, resurrection mystery is ecked into the hearts of our young right from a uh, small. There is a standardization of norms that govern liturgy, but they are not followed. For example, silence. One lector in my church comes to me and says, Father X has set silence to be at this particular moment. Another lector comes and says to me, Father Y has said not at this moment, at another moment. So standardize, uh, the standards need to be communicated to eliminate disasters in liturgy. Liturgy also cannot be hijacked by any event, purpose, need, or person. The celebration of Christ's death resurrection needs to be the focus Everything else can be worked around it. Journeying together may include clergy and laity alike so that there can be no clergy bias nor a domination of influential members of liturgical or parish committee. I think there could be a discussion by the various trainers of liturgy so that all speak the same language so that there is no conflict or confusion. Shamin, one or two minutes. Go ahead. Five yeah, minutes. Saint over, Augustine but... spoke of uh, liturgy being service, training of ministers could be done in a simplistic manner rather than the ministry being reserved for the elite and well-educated. We have emerged into a church that is expected to be served. Sometimes dirty politics in our church make laity want to distance themselves. I have experienced this in many liturgical committees. People get hurt and move away. A dialogue is needed at this point in time. We have to be servants at the service for which ministers need to get off their high horse and most important, be non-judgmental, non-communitarian, unbiased, do what is right rather than what is popular. An attitude of gratitude is of most importance. It needs a paradigm shift. We have gotten complacent and taken the gift of Christianity for granted, sometimes forgetting the sacrifice of the cross rather than liturgy being reduced to just ritual new meaning and new vision to be fostered so that it is enjoyed rather than endured. My hope is that the people of God united at the table of sacrifice are in communion with each other.
participate wholeheartedly and are mission driven. I hope that our journey together is filled with love. That's when everything comes together. That's all. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank you, Shamin, for this wonderful. Uh, so lots of exciting appreciation and then some challenges that we can change. And the, the desire and the dreams that we should have a wonderful church. Uh, so thank you. Now, finally, we have uh, uh, Julian Arlapan. Yeah. Please. Uh, OK. Uh, Father, I have a PowerPoint. I'll just launch it. Hold on. Yes. I'm looking at the time, simply. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Sorry, it is not done clearly. It came uh, and went. Yes, now it has come. Go ahead. Okay, can you see? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, good uh, evening, everybody. So, my, my topic is basically uh, dialogue in the church and society. And uh, basically, I was asked three questions. Uh, the church in Malaysia, the relationship with people. Of Mr. Sarita Kalail, please uh, mute yourself. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. Uh, Mr. And then, the uh, church, church in Malaysia's relationship with people of no religious faith or atheists. And of course, the relationship of the church uh, as far with the environment. So before I started, I thought I'll just do a quick uh, intro because many of you may not be very familiar with the church in Malaysia. So actually, Malaysia is actually a country that is uh, this West Malaysia or Peninsular Malaysia. It's Kuala Lumpur over here, and this is East Malaysia. So East Malaysia is Sabah and Sarawak, and you have Brunei and you have Indonesia. So Malaysia is a little bit unique as a country because we have West and East. Okay, so this is where we are. And I just thought uh, it's a small country. We, our population is only about 33 and a half million, very different from India, <coughs> much bigger. And we have uh, this is the breakdown of the major religions in Malaysia. We are also multicultural and multi religious, just like India, with Islam being the dominant religion. The other religions are basically Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and some other religions like Confucian and so on. And also, we have three major races here Malay, Chinese, and Indian. Just a brief intro. Now, uh, I think as far as the church relationship with others, faiths, I think with the Vatican II, Malaysian church has uh, worked very hard with uh, trying to build bridges with uh, other religions. We have an organization called um, Malaysian Consultative Council, and we have basically all the religions in Malaysia coming together to work together uh on common issues um this will be all religions except islam so uh this is just the logo of that uh, organization the malaysian consultative council of buddhism christianity hinduism sikhism Taoism. we can see the church here with the leaders of all the other faiths except the islamic faith and this is our archbishop of kuala lumpur uh, who is actually the current head of uh, this organization it goes on a rotation basis this organization has been around since 1987 so on a personal basis for me, uh, the church in Malaysia, uh, even at my uh, church level and diocese level, we've got a lot of uh, programs. We have uh, interfaith dialogue. We have uh, RCIA um, where we I, I deal with people from other faiths and we find that uh, they are pleased to become uh, members of the Christian body and they are happy that uh, they have a chance to learn more about Jesus. Some of them come, of course, because they're getting married and so on. And when we have our interfaith dialogue, it's wonderful because at community level, we actually get a chance to visit other places of worship and they get a chance to come to our church and actually look at the altar, look at the church and ask a lot of questions. Uh, some of them are surprised with some of the answers we give. So I think the general uh, relationship is good with all other religions. My personal experience has also been very positive and I hope that we can build on this but our relationship with the dominant religion which is islam is uh, pretty complicated and uh, basically we have many areas uh, and it will take a long time for me to expound but i'll just quickly say we have basically issues with building new places of worship even upgrading like we have a little chapel where i uh, am part of the church where i attend and uh, it was an existing chapel that had to be renovated because they were having some problem with the structure so we shut it down the rebuilding of the chapel took a long time and I, uh, the priest was sharing with me that 
They had gone up to 12 times to the authorities and submitted plans, but all of it was not approved. And until now, the church is still being shut. It's already been three years. And we have been uh, supporting the population from the church into our church for Sunday school, for masses, and so on. The other area is, of course, burial land for the dead. We have a major cemetery in the center of the city. But to get further burial land is very, very difficult. The government has given us a very bad land and it's very difficult for us to actually use it for Christian burial. I think the third issue is maybe what you would have picked up in the media, where we have a lot of difficulties as far as distribution of Bible and Christian printed material in the national language. We're not allowed to circulate the Bible in the national language, the Al-Kitab. Uh, there's been lots of examples of uh, confiscation, desecration. And sadly, Christianity is perceived as a threat. Lah. And uh, politically, so there's a political dimension to it where politicians use it to spread hate and fear. So I'll just show you a quick snapshot. This is the Allah issue where at one stage we were not allowed to use this word uh, in a magazine, a Catholic magazine. We went to court, we fought all the way and we lost. Following this issue, there was some... Um, damage and vandalism to churches. It's just a shot. It's not actually a Catholic church, but it was a Christian church. And then in the third picture below, you can see a picture of a cross. Because of this cross, they had a demonstration and they wanted the, the cross to be removed, which I thought was a bit silly. But uh, this kind of issues actually cause a lot of uh, negativity and hatred and fear to the local communities. And on the right here was actually uh, something that was used to chop the inner part of the Bible that was written in Basel, Malaysia to show that it is a restricted item and there was actually something like a desecration. So we have this kind of issues. So my view on this matter, uh, I think the church needs to build a lot more bridges with this arm and the other. Yeah, Julian, uh, one or two minutes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, okay. And uh, I think we need to work harder. And I think the church needs to raise its profile very quickly, like building a relationship with other, other religions. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much to say as far as uh, relationship with people of no religions or atheists, but uh, we have done, the church has done some work with natives and all that, and we find that uh, they are receptive to Catholicism and Christianity. And I believe the church has not really focused on this group because uh, they are a very small group, uh, okay, less than 1% of the population. Now, as far as the environment is concerned, since the Pope uh, Francis uh, Encilical, we have done a lot. We had many Lenten campaigns about the environment and creation. Basically, this is uh, some snapshots of how our Lenten campaign has been running here. And I just want to share one quick one before I end. Uh, recently, just before Christmas last year, there was a major flood. And I think the church did very well. This was an impact from the environment and the church did very well. And the interesting thing about it was one community, the Sikh community was very well prominent, prominently featured in the press because they were doing a lot of things. And I think the church must learn from this by doing more, by opening churches as shelters, providing meals and financial support. We did a lot of things. It's just a snapshot of the flood uh, and all those people that were affected. And I think we need to work harder. And also our relationship with the major dominant religion, Islam, we need to definitely work and build on it better than that. Okay, so that I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian Arulapu, for your wonderful presentation. That's a very challenging area, uh, the <laughs> religious dialogue. Thank you. And uh, with uh, uh, other religions, and then uh, you're doing well, and you're facing lots of challenges. That's uh, Yes. So thank you, four of you, for your presentations, for your sharing, your exp experiences, and uh, reflections. Yes, now we'll open it to the, for all. Yes. So if you have, you may not have questions, because they are not here to answer any question directly. But please uh, add your uh, reflections or your own experiences. Uh, you remember the five areas that uh, we are asked to reflect upon. The first one is the fundamental question, uh, the, the being church and the, the level of what it is to be a church. And then the second one is listening. How are we shaping up? Are we good at listening to each other? And then the third one is speaking out. Do we have space to tell and share our difficulties, our stories, even our joys? So, so in those areas, and the third, another one is sharing responsibilities for our common mission. As someone already mentioned, uh, with a lively priest, there is a wonderful uh, life in the parish. But if you have another priest, then everything goes down. So what do we do with that? So because we rely entirely on uh, heavily on a priest's creativity and capacities, so it either survives or it uh, dissipates because of one priest. So like that. So what are we doing so that the life continues beyond the capacities of the priest? And then discerning and deciding. So how do we make decisions? 
and then how are we celebrating and because you also you made some comments so I, i'm not going to say more about that so please go ahead and then share your reflections your comments and your views and opinions uh, to build up it could be a question it could be a comment it could be um, uh, sharing it has to become more sharing not a heavily intellectual but share simply from your heart or you can even have a, a, a bizarre question or a very difficult question i am very angry with something please share that it will be wonderful if you say you want to say that say that that's the best thing to say uh, that's the thing and even if who is there, and also you can represent those who are frustrated with the church disappointed with the church who left the church or who have problems with the church and also the joys and hopes those who are very happy with the church uh, so all those things you can share uh, you have to keep the track of these uh, raising hands Yes, yes, I will take care of that, no problem. First of all, Sam, thank you so much. And I would like to really appreciate all the four speakers. Impressive presentation, clarity of clarity thought, of thought. Personal, personal sharing, personal sharing. sharing. Uh, and really, 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 really wonderful job. And all the others have supported. And I also want to um, uh, welcome Father George Manimala, Father uh, Francis uh, Gonzalez, and Sister Shalini have all joined. So it's a joy to have all of you. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe we'll begin with questions. Uh, Noel Peters, you have already raised your question. I mean, raise your hand. Please go ahead. Praise the Lord, Father. Praise the Lord to all members. Uh, Father, thank you for giving me the opportunity. So I have yes. a question and yeah. I have a suggestion. So first I'll go with the question. At first I would like to thank Julian. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation and to Grace and other members as well. Father, Father I have a question. I have a question and the question is, I think other people can, other people can you please move your mic. Go so, ahead again. So our Holy Father has given us a purpose, uh, a purpose of life and a purpose of living. But I want to ask, maybe the priest or any of the people can answer this question. When I will see a time when I can say that we are united in Christ rather than divided in community? This is my first thing, a biggest concern. Because I have seen the biggest enemy of Christians are Christians itself. Second thing, we are, we are, I'm, I'm, uh, we are, I'm, very, I'll be candidly speaking on this. We have never seen as one voice, one Christianity. We are not united Christians. We are divided Christians. And that is the reason there are many of the things we face in our life. And that's a fact. So as a church, as a priest, because priest people are considered as the holy people, because we follow your uh, priest and all. The people, those who work, we follow them as leaders because maybe they have much more experience and knowledge. In the churches also I've seen there are priests, those who create, you know, different bifurcations between the community, divisions, biasness. So on one hand, there is a cause to come in one communion, to come in one community. And when we think about the grassroots level, the ideal situation and the actual situation, there is a huge variation in that. So how you would like to share your thought on that? This is practically truth i'm being sharing it to thank you uh, to father that you told that whatever you have you can be honest to speak out now second thing as a suggestions i would like to share is that uh, julian i saw your presentation i was going through now when we talk about the christian population all across the world we are 2.3 billion christians in all across the world and in terms of percentage we are 31.12 percentage far beyond than other communities, far beyond than other communities. But still, we are afraid. Still, we are not able to support each other. Still, we are facing lacks, lots and lots of problems. Still, we are not able to profess our faith. We are not able to talk about our faith. We are not able to, you know, go with the flow of our faith. I mean, that huge population, still we are facing this kind of problems. So as a suggestion, what I believe, instead of, you know, going through a hell number of presentations, talking very beautiful words, things, Pope, uh, Holy Father has given something, we have to start something from reality. And that will come until and unless we accept each other that we are one Christian in Jesus Christ, rather than thinking that we are bifurcated. And the third thing, 
i will conclude the third thing when we see that we face lot of problems so we will face lot of problem because already the scripture says that the testimony will come upon christians the chapters in revelations also says that we have to give lot of testimonies there there will be lot of problems on christians and there will be the god will see how our faith has been alive so that will come that is true the scripture says it is true so it will happen but we have to keep ourselves united so this is this was from suggestion point of view but question if anyone can answer my question which i asked about how we can be united christian thank you so much father for giving me this opportunity uh, i am not sure whether we should answer the question we are aware that there is a question that's about that speaks about our dif uh, difficulties and divisions and then we are not what we hope to be dream to be so you highlighted important issues the problems within the church in our you uh, being one united church across the world and all that so thank you for sharing i think these things will come all over the world and then they will come into uh, your diocese and level your parish level i suppose you will be able to present in your parish and then it will come to the national and international issues they will be attended later but then uh, we have become aware of that is important thing both uh, your uh, your uh, suggestions as well i think better we listen to many people that's more important than listening and getting an answer yes uh, raj go ahead with other list of people you can do the yes. names maybe you are mr anthony martin yeah thank you father good evening After everybody um, the others please uh, go for mute mute yes go ahead uh, it's truly uh, what i hear from what is being shared so far i see that uh, there are lots of hurts within the catholic church among the church and uh, when i look at the logo of the synodata it reminds me of the road to mouse i think that's what we should all be looking at that we have to be need to go on this journey of road to mouse and undo all our prejudices all our barriers which was mentioned and be able to see things in a more in a clearer mindset that we be a more welcoming church be more open to especially those people who are broken who have left the church there are many issues which we have within the catholic church lots of it even among the clergy itself the the the, the damages done by them damages globally we have seen and many people have left the church and it's so sad and they are still catholics i would say they are still disciples of christ so the church has to look into itself to see how all these healings can be brought about so the road to mouse is very important so that after that once we are all we know what happened exactly at the end of the, when they reached the destination how jesus opened their mind and then we go back to our various places i think we can be truly be a really effective church this road to mouse is very important for us otherwise it's going to be a journey of we are just continuing to keep walking and walking and to nowhere so i would say this road to mouse is very important that the church has to unlearn and be able to see the healings the hospital in the field like pope francis has mentioned it's very important we need to be hospitals in the field and the church has to really put its ears to the ground to see and no more dominance by particular group of catholics where they dominate and then we see uh, lots of people then they just move to the side and then they just become you know talents wasted and they they are no more contributing so the church needs a lot of healing thank you that's a very good sharing so we are together as equals and we have to go in a maze way so that we can visualize in the dynamic process so that's and knowing our strengths and uh, struggles and as well as the difficulties and failures so, so we have to acknowledge them and then we will be able to move ahead that's a good suggestion thank you next next is valentine please go ahead yeah thank you father and uh, thank you to all the uh, presenters and presenters uh, and presenters and uh, who shared about that your sharing or, or, and uh, presentation for actually excellent i find and inspiring for me and challenging also and thought for provoking being an indian first thing i uh, being an indian i am i find this synodality and uh, uh, synodal church uh, challenge 
actually i am trying to understand uh, especially i was inspired by uh, miss grace david's uh, sharing she shared about the, the theological aspect of uh, synodal uh, synodal church communion participation and mission and uh, the christian anthropology is spoken about but i find the anthropology in india and the really catholic and uh, christian anthropology i feel there is a uh, difference uh, differences among them so is, if there is a difference how can we bring because we are finding social difference here cultural diversity religious diversity we are finding and so anthropological diversity we are finding so how can this synodality will be actually be effective how can we go when these anthropologies are actually differing each other they are against each other this is the question arising in me thank you thank you for highlighting that we have understanding of people that is making us very very different and then we we have to look at it so we need to look at it and analyze it and find ways to get over that so we have to overcome that i think that will take time but then you you raised that point very well thank you valentine thank next you. Next is Mr. Roy Sequeira from Goa. Mr. Roy, maybe his connection is lost. Okay. If not, somebody else. Next, anybody else wants to seek clarification or I mean, add your comment, share your experience? Hello. Can you yeah. hear me, Father? Yeah, I hear it. Yes. Yeah, I am coming. Yes. Just hold on. Father, it was a nice presentation. I just want which I would like to make. So I just want to put it across so for the betterment of the church and growth of the church. So first uh, I want to th is, uh, talk about can you hear me, Father? All? Yes. yes. Hello? Yes. Am I audible, right, Father? Okay. Yes, you are. Father, first I want to stress. Yeah, first, first I want to stress on the catechism, which we are thinking uh, for the for children and for the youth. And this catechism has to be totally revived, uh, considering the challenges of, of the world which we are facing through various media and misinformation and the various sects which are almost the, in opposite. So, greater awareness has to made to the youth as well as the children to grow in faith and to know their faith and to stand with their faith and to fight with the opposition which they may ignore when they go into that. Many of us lose the, uh, the faith when they go to the stages and work life, get disconnected. This has to be only the youth. We see in many of the parish of school and standard catechism is SSP, there is no catechism. Where the youth is the which is the very important age where they have to be catechized and they should know about the sin its effects and position as which they will so into. this is one thing which uh, has to stress very uh, a total revival which has to inculcate from the liturgy point of I think your connection is lost. Roy, only I have a problem. Hello. Am I disconnected or? No, Father, I Hello, think he's... Is having a problem with this yeah. this last connection. Yeah, so he highlighted the importance of catechism and then updating that. It's only from you, 1990s of okay. Vatican II. Yes. So you Hello. you spoke about the catechism's importance and then we need to revise. Yes, Father. And then we have to really use very modern means to communicate to the youth. Yes. Yes, Father. Yes. So we have someone Prakash wanted to make yeah. sharing about uh, responding to the previous uh, comments. Gosh. Okay. Good evening, Father, and thank you for uh, giving me the time. Am I audible? Yes, go ahead. Brief. Okay. 
Uh, my own experience to the question put by Mr. Noel, the unity of Christianity. So uh, I do not know about the other places, but what I have experienced in my own place, uh, uh, that is in my diocese, uh, we are united. Beyond that, like uh, uh, in our place, in our district, uh, we have an umbrella of Christian, all the Christians call United Christian Forum. So even if one of the Christian family is uh, uh, harassed or even if they face any kind of problem, all the Christian uh, leaders, they come together and help in solving any kind of problem. Uh, like uh, for an example, uh, one man, uh, he, was, uh, he has the only family who was Christian in that entire area. And uh, uh, because of the new government, the RSS people tried to capture his land and uh, build their own buildings. But uh, all the Christians came together and uh, they have uh, uh, legally fought on behalf of him. So uh, it, my own personal experience is that uh, though we have only 28 percentage of Christianity in my district, but then uh, not even one Christian uh, a family is uh, kept aside when he has any kind of problem. So uh, this is uh, just a, an example that I have experienced uh, in my own uh, place. Thank you so much. Thank Adi. you, Prakash. I think already Roy has uh, made his comment. Mary oh, Sundaram Adi. and Arye and then Renisha, Renisha Mal. Mary Sundaram, go ahead, please. May, Miss, May, Mrs. Mary, are you there? Okay. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I had muted myself. Okay. Uh, yes. One speaker before me had mentioned about this uh, children not being catechized uh, properly. This is a problem which I also faced with my children. See, we put our children in Catholic schools specifically so that they would have a good grounding in the basics of, Christ of Catholic faith. But I found that uh, while my daughter, who was uh, in a school run by the sister, Salation sisters, they didn't have, we didn't face any problem there. But my son was placed in another school uh, run by another uh, brother, some brothers, whom I don't want to name. But he, I did not find any attention to faith formation. So I believe that particularly where there are Catholic schools, this is a very, very important topic because we, in any case, those who are in secular schools, there is a problem of faith formation for our Catholic children who attend there. But if we have to find the same problem, even in Catholic schools, where we choose specifically to put our children in Catholic schools because we want that faith formation also, then it is very, uh, I think it's an area which uh, the church really needs to look into. That's one. The second is, there. somebody also mentioned about divisions within uh, various Christ, uh, Christian, Christian, like among Christian uh, uh, Catholics and other Christians and all. Father, I have noticed that even among the clergy, there is a lot of issues of caste divisions. And many are still uh, using their like uh, their uh, second names uh, just like the secular people do so this this is an area which i feel uh, when you start using if you limit yourself to your first name only which is your christian name i think that the break you have to break away from that uh, issue of caste completely and it has to be led by the clergy so that is second because all the time, like, you know, we hear about this bishop did not put that person in this particular place because of this uh, caste problem and also it's, it's a very disturbing thing as it is among secular we people, laity, we have this problem. Over that, if you have it with the cat, with the clergy also, it, it's very disturbing. The last thing is one thing which was mentioned just before me, I think, about this land issue. Father, we when we read about what is happening about... Uh, 
we already know that uh, a lot of these other organizations they have an idea about capturing because they feel that catholics uh, christians uh, christian organizations have a lot of land so there is a lot of this land uh, you know trying to move us out so that they get the land but it is very disturbing when we find that divisions among the christian communities they are actually inviting the, the the other uh, you know uh, you know what i mean those people to come and literally arbitrate between us all this is very disturbing for us at, uh, in the laity because we want to see the unity at the higher levels at the hierarchical level also thank you father thank you for uh, sharing that yes now slowly you are bringing up lots of issues and concerns and you started scratching things not that we have solutions but it's good to become aware of the concerns that we have whether it is land or the authority or power or caste or uh, uh, patriarchy so all those things have to come up then you have one year to discuss all these things and to come up with some concrete solutions so good continue some more uh, comments please r a who is r a raise your initial right yes yeah please go ahead hello um thank you so much Uh, I appreciate all the comments that have been coming. They're really great. Um, I'll share my experience in short. Uh, first of all, I agree that we need interreligious dialogue with the current situation in our country, whereby there have been so many attacks on uh, on Christians during Christmas. Uh, I think that we need to crush that superiority complex that we have as Christians, like as because we are Christians, we are greater than the uh, Hindu or the Muslim or the other community. Because I see that happening a lot in the church. um the way you dress the way you speak people refusing to even learn their local languages speaking only their only english and what not uh and this needs to change so a bit of humility needs to come in uh and i think we need to stop look we, despite all of us doing this beautiful course on theology uh we are still not realizing that we are now empowered to at least understand our faith better because i think everybody has their own ideas but we're still looking towards a hierarchy a hierarchy that is not necessarily um uh, you know uh, not necessarily working in in the interest of the people is in, in, is working in the interest of protecting uh, an institute uh, but we are the people and um, pope francis has spoken about the upside down pyramid but nobody works on it i think we need to ask ourselves are we really practicing our christianity or are we just limited to reading the bible uh going to church and you know uh, i need i think we need to look at christianity is far beyond something like that uh i was i was involved with the synod the mid term synod in 2012 13 in mumbai um the archdiocese of bombay and i was involved in various levels from the point of data entry and data processing to writing papers to writing the booklet uh to being part of the final synod discussion in, in, in bombay and uh, all i can tell you is that at every stage data has been disappearing the data has been removed data has been redacted i say that as a researcher because i i hate to see good good research work disappearing like that so all your ideas are beautiful and and i appreciate um uh, dr rajkumar's efforts to send our responses to uh, the vatican uh but as far as i know this 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 pathway is not full proof and fortunately this pathway might I mean, uh, what we are saying may disappear somewhere you may honestly dr rajkumar may honestly give our responses over there but they will just disappear um so your su solution suggestions is not going to work through a hierarchy work your solutions where you are be the christian where you are and bloom where you are you have done this course for a reason uh yeah that's my sharing sorry it's a little <laughs> i don't mean to sound angry and i don't hate the church so please don't assume that people who challenge the church and criticize the system are hating the church i love the church and i expect the church to be much better than what it is presenting itself to be today thank you so much the last yes. the last statement was amazing good we need father rachma can i just add something to what the previous speaker said coming from malaysia a totally different country i'll just take about 2 minutes you see what she says is very true we always expect the hierarchy and the church leaders to actually drive it but i think the solution as she has rightly pointed out can actually come from the ground and i just share this small example like in in the community where i live i live in a, as you know in a muslim country we have a church we have a mosque we have a temple a hindu temple and we also have a buddhist temple so what we have done at church level 
we have actually initiated contact build relationships we have gone over to the each other's respective church place of worship have a meal with them have a dialogue with them invite them to the church show them how the mass is done it's something so simple yet i can tell you today an initiative that was started only a few years ago we have a very positive relationship even with the muslims living in our community with their church and this is exactly what the previous speaker was saying we don't rely on the church we don't sorry on church hierarchy on the leadership but on the ground and if every little community or district were to do simple things like this focusing on common good i think you'll find the relationship of the church the image of the church and all that will change so much more than uh, the some of the problems that we are facing now so just a little comment from me thank you father Thank you. Uh, that's a comment on Rachel. I wanted to say just one word. That's very important. How comfortable we are to have lots of Hindu friends, Muslim friends, and ask them about their religious and spiritual experiences. We simply, it's good to have an idea that my religion is the right religion, but do I have a respectful uh, dialogue and conversations with the Hindus and Muslims? You ask your Hindu guys, this is the time, Senate time, ask your Hindu friends, honestly tell me what do you think about christians they will have a huge stories to tell you about our pride and our arrogance and our all those things and this is the time to listen to them not that i mean not a fellow who may be very enemy of the church no very good hindu friends you ask them to tell them what do they really think about the christianity and the church there are wonderful things they appreciate there are wonderful things they say we are not at all ready to listen to what is wrong with the church from the others within ourselves we have plenty of things so just to add to what you said uh, rachel thank you that's important time i think to listen to them good hindu friends and people of other religions go ahead next father stand there are last i think there are three more i think we'll fix that we have to close with them. three interactions yes, sure. last three interactions renisha mal mr david anthony sami and mr patrick anthony <laughs> one by one go ahead <laughs> yeah go mr renisha mr renisha please go ahead Yes, uh, thank you, Father Rajkumar. I'm really inspiring listening to all the speakers and comments coming in for today's session. Uh, one point that I want to make is like you know normally when we speak about the relationship with, between the church and 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 Jesus, we always refer to it as the bride and the bridegroom. Like Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. So when we're talking about that relationship, we also expect equality. Uh, and the relationship has to be blurring so it's a responsibility on on both the sides you know to be more responsible and commit ourselves uh, to to the activities in the church and you know bringing others together and uh, today it's not, and it's not only about uh, you know people who are there it's also about making new leaders like what are we doing for the youth so that they can come and you know be a part of this relationship come and be a uh, you know encourage them in being a part of this relationship because uh, now nowadays it's even becoming more tougher because due to covid and you know many other things we are not being able to participate in the church that much how it is how how it is how it was before this before the pandemic so there is a lot of responsibility like it's only getting tougher like you know to build this relationship i feel it's only getting tougher and if we survive this the relationship will only become stronger it will not be weak so you know in our own ways like you know even though sunday school and everything is online uh, encouraging our community children our uh, zonal children you know like you know bringing them together we know we cannot bring all of them in one place but in in a, in a zone zone where you know where we can have some activities so so that it only it grows it doesn't become inverted pyramid doesn't mean like you know reducing the people also it's even about increasing the community so that's one uh, suggestion and thought that i had as long as you don't threaten the priest and the nuns nearby you can have a <laughs> prayer service also otherwise mm -hmm. you rely on the priest then that will not, not much will happen so that's mm -hmm. a wonderful initiative renisha thank you next mr david anthony sami yeah okay uh, my question is uh, more on a specific uh, area of LB lbgt because uh, earlier miss grace mentioned that we are going to reach reaching out to them uh, my question is are we trying to change them or are we trying to accept them and my my fear is that if we get too close to them are they going to influence our young people 
Uh, thank you for that question. It's it needs lots of discussions. I mean, I, and when, I don't know whether in one minute I can answer. Pope Francis made it very clear, uh, also through the church teachings, the ma understanding of the marriage and sexuality remains. God made us male and female. And the marriage is between male and female, and the church will bless such marriages only. But in the world, we have many people with these whatever you, LGBT and etc. issues. So uh, we have to respect them and appreciate them and understand them, uh, and then we have to uh, honor them. And then it has become a little more tricky when the civil unions are recognized by many countries in the world. India not yet, but India might also accept the civil unions. And the church, what will we do? Because they will have, they are not using the word civil marriages, civil unions, not the regular marriage, because of various reasons. The whole idea was they were persecuted, they were persecuted and tortured in the past. So both the church and the societies have civilized themselves to say, we cannot uh, persecute and then uh, torture and kill them. There were people, when, instances when they were killed and tortured. No. But then how do we still handle we are in an ambiguous place. Uh, so I would agree with that, David Anthony, that we are in an ambiguous place. Will they influence our children so that others also will be influenced by them is a huge issue. We will have to discuss that shortly another time. But you brought it up very well. Thank you for bringing up this forum. Yes. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Next, Mr. Patrick Anthony. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Father, for organizing this session today. Um, for, for me, it's just a sharing and, a, and, and something that reading the chats about the questions about catechesis and catechism and all that. Just sharing an incident that happened a couple of weeks ago with a group of parents whose children, teenagers, 17-year-olds, who are going to get confirmed this year. That's how it happens in Malaysia, where they, they go through a number of years of Sunday school and then they get confirmed at the age of 17. So, with this group of parents, a simple question that I put out to them is that it's a simple math. Can you just calculate over the number of years that you've sent your children to Sunday school and everything, right? Over the number of years that you've sent them, can you just calculate and tell me how many days have they spent learning about our God? And the shocking answer that we came to, the conclusion that we came was just 48 hours over a period of 11 years of Sunday school education the number of hours accumulated is just 48 hours. So the question that I put back is that does our responsibility as parents end at just sending our children to Sunday school? So I think part of the thing is that we, we've got a beautiful thing, the family unit. The family unit needs to play a very big role in the imparting of faith and bringing up our children in that way. Today, so beautifully, we had that young girl who started us, started us off with that prayer, you know, and that song. And I think, as a family, for me, I I was blessed. I'm very much blessed with my late parents, who put in the importance of Bible, reading the Bible, family prayer, meals before meals, praying together, having family meals together. So we were all imparted with that, and that is being carried on now to our children. And as families, do are we doing that or not? And I think for, for me is that the, the point of to, towards the church in this synod process and all. I think if, if it comes out with a point on stressing the importance of family life, the prayer in family life, all these family values that will help to develop our children, then I think we, 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 we have maybe not to say a very bright future, but it's a starting point to create that brighter future for our children who will be strengthened and rooted in the faith. So just, just, Thank you, just Patrick. my reflection for that. Yes, it's an eye-opener. The more we invest, the more we'll get. If you have how many hours we invest in God, then we will get back. Otherwise, we, you are an eye-opener that way. How much time we have. Next. Mm -hmm. Father Rajkumar, can I say a word? Just half a second, not more yes. than that. Please go ahead quickly. There was there was a question regarding uh, acceptance, uh, the church accepting the LBGT community. Uh, being a teacher and having um, uh, interacted and having had quite a few children uh, who have the gender preferences, it's just uh, that uh, you know I would like to put this thought across that at the end of the day, uh, you know uh, uh, when parents have children who are special special children okay we don't call them disabled or retarded any longer we say special children and we accept them as a gift from god and bringing them up is a challenge in itself calling for many sacrifices um 
with quite a uh, not a big background, but yes, with the limited knowledge that I have and uh, the study that I've done uh, regarding this particular area, uh, it is uh, not the child's fault regarding the sexual orientation. It is much to do with, uh, you can say, nature's cruel joke, okay, on these individuals, all right? So uh, uh, we need to be a little bit more open-minded. Uh, religion, yes. And the Bible, what the Bible says is absolutely right. But we need to understand at the end of the day, these people are also human beings. God has created them with this difference. It's it's very rarely that it's a choice. Okay. Uh, I, I, it's not what I'm saying, but this is what studies have proved. It will. It is a very elaborate uh, and it requires a lot of time to talk about. But as a teacher, because... Uh, uh, you know, our narrow mentality towards this has actually caused a child losing his life, you know. And I have come across one such case in my life, which has yep. taken place 11 years ago, and it has still impacted me as a teacher. Okay, so uh, I can imagine what it does to the parent. And uh, I think uh, as followers of Christ, when Christ could accept the marginalized, the prostitutes, and eat with the sinners. And he said, it's not the healthy who require, uh, you know, require him, but it is this, he's come to minister to the unwell, correct? So we have to accept, we have to embrace all these people. I think that will be in our own way, whatever we can. I think that needs to be done. And we are moving in that direction. I can see that happening. Because in our very own church, we'll be having a, 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 a program for the transgender. They'll be coming across. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot actively participate in it. But it is something that, honestly speaking, I'm, I'm grateful to God that this change is happening. Thank I think so the purpose much. of synod is achieved by your sharing. Thank you. Candice, thank, thank you for sharing. You are the, you. That's the purpose. Are we ready to listen to the people that may have a different opinion than you? You shared very well. And then there's a very strong opinion. I have a problem with that, Louise, uh, on that now. Uh, LGBTQ is not exactly like a prostitute. It's not a sin that you have to completely change them. Either you are in or out. And if you change, you are in. If you are out, you are out. That's a very strong statement. I will That we will have to qualify later. But only one question, Pope will tell you now. Do you have friends? Did you talk to them? Did you take to the families? Did you see this is Louise? I'm asking. Do you have friends from LGBTQ people? Did you talk to them about their experiences? Did you talk to their families about what it is to have the children from this orientation? Then we'll talk. That's that's what Pope Francis is telling. It's not the issue is about they are wrong, either they change or come in, or you're wrong, you're get out. No. So the whole issue is do you listen to them and what do their experience of their God is? And how are they fighting with the God who made them like that? Avoiding all those things is no point. Listen to them. That's what this time is. Candice, thank you for bringing that very, very well. Yes. I don't know who is in the next last, line. The last one, one, actually, because... because Father, excuse me. I think the Synod will begin yeah. now another few hours, if you allow. But Raj Kumar, you say something. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Dorothy, please go ahead. I, last one. I don't have a question. I just want to share something, my opinion. Uh, like uh, His Holiness, the Pope uh, did the Year of the Faith. I think all this is just part of a program to keep our faith alive. Each year, he has, he's, in his wisdom, he has to come up with something so that the people of God don't sleep, you know. So we are active in, so he came up with this idea like uh, Grace, uh, David sh shared about the communion participation. The church is a group of believers who are in communion and take part in the mission of Christ. So it is already ongoing. It's just that whether the churches are sleeping, the people are sleeping or not active. So the, it's just a, to me, I, from what I hear, all this is just a program to keep us alive and to keep the thing going. That's... <laughs> To keep the church going, right? Just like when he when uh, His Holiness initiated the Year of the Faith, 
oh, we, the churches build the door of the faith and the pilgrims come and people are all excited, you know? It's just another program to get us all excited. I mean, that is my two cents worth. Thank you. Yeah, just one, one caution. Let's not be worried about the sensational cases. Will married priests be there and when priests can marry and what will be happen to the LGBTQ? Will same-sex marriage allowed in the church? They are all very sensational things. Whatever changes will take place, we don't know. But they should not distract entirely the very meaning of the church, participation, mission. We can have a wonderful church where if there are sen sensational issues, we may not be able to resolve. Or we may resolve, we may have a better understanding. But we should not completely reduce everything into what exactly tell me about a b c otherwise uh, this is not the church we are expecting so please participate that's the whole purpose this year and then coming years raj go ahead yes father stan allah thank you so much for so patiently so magnanimously helping one another to enter into discussion and also enlightening our people it has been wonderful listening to you and also my dear friends, thanks for your clarifications. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for your sharing. All of you participating actively. That makes this program more meaningful. Uh, Dorothy at the end was saying, is it just to keep the church alive going? In our families, we have celebrations for birthdays. We have some occasions to come together and do something. And they are all not just to keep us excited, but they make a our life body of the family, they add a new feather into it. It brings something new to each family. Similarly to the church, all these programs, the year ones, it might look like an event, but ultimately they add something to each of us. And that is where this one synod is supposed to give us that synodal consciousness. All of us belong to people of God, one body. We care for one another. Some may be having difficulties, some may not have difficulties, but we are called to enter into that communion, care for one another, compassionate, empathy, love and build this church together. We belong to one family. Hierarchical communion is only to facilitate, help the process of all of us. So with that thought, we would end. And for that, I request Mr. Rezi Lawrence Rose from Lucknow to propose a word of thanks. Mr. Rezi, please stay on. Don't leave. We shall honor our friend, Mr. Rezi, who is a very active member in his church. Please, Mr. Rezi, over to you. Unmute. Hello. It was a delightful session. Thank you, Father. Listening. That is a very important point. Do we listen with an open ear? Or just we listen for the purpose? I, want I was want given this uh, opportunity this morning to honor and get the honors done. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. A moment of difference makes a difference in your attitude. Good evening, everyone. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. I was one in perfect determination to encourage to make life successful. Today it was a and you all are blessed to acknowledge sharing thoughts via this wonderful platform of that. A program organized by Vidya Jyoti. On behalf of the organization, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all our team guests, Synodal Team of Archdiocese of Delhi, Ms. Grace David and Reverend Sister Rundam started on a very positive and good. The wonderful speakers of the day insight beauty of Mrs. Sylvia D'Souza from the Mesmerizing of Goa, Ms. Morris from the capital city of India, Mumbai, and the one and the only lucky male speaker of the day, 
not from the beautiful land of beautiful beaches rainforest and skyscraper of malay peninsula of malaysia mr julian rupo congratulations to you dear a wonderful team by the director ramen father rajkumar sincere thanks to the heads of all the various department of edp who handled the event throughout these are the unsung heroes who cannot be seen on the stage but they are working tirelessly behind the stage to keep the limelight going this session would not be completed without a most experienced and humble person who played a very crucial role of the moderator which at times are very tough is as walking on the rope without any props but he executed his skill to great and ultimate perfection thank you dear father stan for your gracious presence it was a privilege to see you and to have you with your spiritual guidance and blessing a wide round of applause for our dearest the multi talented lovely smiling charming you yeah, i'm not finding words enough to have a tall claim for father rajkumar director of depth who we all are in depth for giving a wonderful opportunity to showcase our views talents and encouraging our faith and understanding to giving a chance of renewal and fresh beginning of faith and life why what a wonderful wonderful participants would like to thank all of you whose presence makes this event more memorable than i would like to thank each and all for making this event a great and grand success thank you one and all god bless thank you mr rezi lawrence ro thanks for covering the entire program and thanking everyone thank you so much god bless you and my dear friends the last word on the last online class today we are closing the entire program from july we have been journeying and the journey together was gracious and god blessed us all the time we have grown we have learned we learn to listen and then let us empower one another help one another continue the journey until july so we will once again take off from july till then see you all god bless each and every one of you and your families god bless thank you everyone very specially the speaker thank you very much father thank you father thank, thank you so thank you speaker thank you brother 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 Father Raj, are you coming thank to you, Malaysia? Thank you, Father Raj. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father Raj, for the opportunity. Father Raj, are you coming to Malaysia for our face-to-face? -face? Yeah, let us see if your graduation time. We shall plan that. Are you thank ready? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Father Raj, yes. are we going to see you this year? No, I mean for the graduation. When you all have graduation, we shall plan to come to Malaysia. You should finish. Okay. <laughs> Two years time. Yes. Not this year. Not this year. Okay. Thank you. See you Thank then. You. Bye Two bye years bye. time. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Good night. Bye Thank bye. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yesu Rathnam. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Father.